um, over the next couple of minutes. Um, but uh, good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Kristen Amston, and I'm one of the adult programming librarians at the Ballantine branch of Richland Library. We are so happy to be able to welcome all of you to tonight's program, our Prince of Scribes Writers Remember Pat Conroy. We're pleased to have Jonathan Haupt, the executive director of the Pat Conroy Literary Center in Beaufort, South Carolina, back with us. The original plan was to have this program live in our Ballantine branch, but thankfully, Mr. Haupt was happy to be able to give this presentation virtually. And because we're hosting it virtually, we're able to welcome so many more people than we would have been able to otherwise. We have a lot of guests here tonight, not only from outside of Richland County, but outside of the state as well. And so we're so glad to have you. A couple of things to note before we get started. All participants are in listening mode only. At the end of the presentation, Jonathan will be able to take some questions. However, if you think of questions as you're listening to the presentation, you can go ahead and type them into the chat box. Um, and you'll just need to use the uh, chat box to type in your questions. Also, if you have any trouble hearing us during the presentation, please let us know by using the chat box. Uh, we've got a couple people who will be monitoring the chat for any issues that might arise. And also, please continue to check out Richland Library's website for other online programming that we will be doing throughout the remainder of this year. Now, I'm pleased to be able to welcome Jonathan Haupt. Thank you. It's so nice to be with you and to have so many of you here virtually in the Zoom room tonight as well. Going to mess around with my screen just a little bit. There we are. So I can see something uh, that looks a little closer to what you all are seeing. Uh, so when we agreed to do this virtually, at that point, I thought I'm just going to do this from my home library. Then along the way, it occurred to me, why do that when I can do it from our nonprofit Pat Conroy Literary Center right here in Beaufort? So that's where I am tonight. And for those of you who have visited the center before, and I know that's a few people on the call, I am in front of Mr. Conroy's desk uh, here behind me. So this is sort of the centerpiece of our exhibit here in Beaufort. And um, I'm on an iPad, and I only mention that because I'm going to do some screen shares along the way. And because of the peculiarities of the iPad, it may look like I'm trying to poke your eye out through the screen. That's just me loading up the next photo. Most of what I want to talk about tonight relates to this book right here, Our Prince of Scribes, Writers Remember, Pat Conroy, thus the title of our program. But above and beyond that, I want to share some pieces from Mr. Conroy that are unpublished, um, perhaps completely new to some of you all on the call and some stories and maybe some artifacts along the way that relate to the stories in the book, but aren't necessarily in the book at all. And that also gives me an opportunity to talk a little bit more about my connections to Pat Conroy and how I came to be in the Conroy orbit to begin with. And that's really what I want to start with just by way of, of uh, further introducing myself and sort of setting the stage for the stories that will follow. I'm going to warn you in advance that part of this presentation is interactive to the degree that it can be in our, in our virtual environment here. There are 67 essays uh, from 67 writers in our Prince of Scribes, and even in our program tonight, we don't have time to mention all of them. So rather than just having me decide which ones we should or shouldn't share, we're going to do something where I'm going to invite you all uh, to make some selections, uh, something I like to refer to as bibliomancy, the magic of books, which historically would have been trying to divine the future from a book. We're going to divine the past by virtue of some memories in the book. So at some point, uh, we'll do that. We'll just uh, make it clear that I'm looking for some suggestions, and you'll just be picking numbers and posting them in the chat, and that'll help me decide which direction we get to go when we get to that point. But right now, we're going to begin at the beginning, and in this case, my beginning with Pat Conroy. I was, uh, before all this, before there was a Pat Conroy Literary Center, I was in Columbia, South Carolina, where quite a few of you are uh, in the Richland Library uh, patrons community tonight. And I was the uh, director of the University of South Carolina Press, the magnificent publisher of our state's flagship university. And it was in that capacity that I really got to know Pat. I had met him when I was a publicist for U.S. and Press, but I didn't really get to know him one-on-one -on -one until I was on the cusp of becoming director. Uh, I had a lot of ideas of what the University Press should do, and several of them got Pat Conroy really excited. So he agreed to write a letter of reference for me when I was an internal candidate to become the director. 
and I'm going to share this uh, with you. This is an unpublished piece that exists nowhere other than in my collection. And uh, fair warning, it reflects well on me, although that's not why I'm sharing it. I'm sharing it because it reflects really well on Pat Conroy and explains better than uh, perhaps I can what it was like to be championed by Pat Conroy, not only be his friend, but to be somebody that he would root for, that he would go out of his way to help. So let me load that slide up for you. And then once it's up, I'm gonna read it to you. And let's find it here in our deck. There it is. So the photo is of Pat and I in Columbia, a really wonderful photographer, Ann McQuarrie, was there in town with you all, took that photo outside one of the TV studios one day. And here's the letter. I'm going to zoom that so we can all see it together. There we are. It might take just a second for it to pop up on your screen. So uh, this is Pat, of course. Dear Dr. Steve Lynn. Now, first of all, I love that he spelled out the word doctor, which is completely unnecessary, but that was Pat Conroy. My name is Pat Conroy, and I'm a South Carolina writer. Now, that too is also a completely unnecessary sentence because absolutely everybody knew that. But Pat was very humble and always wanted to sort of lead with that. So I'm going to stop interrupting Pat and just read from this point. I've got four brothers and a sister who are Gamecocks and consider me a much lesser man because I'm only a Citadel Bulldog. I'm writing this letter in support, no, to ridiculously enthusiastic support of Jonathan Haupt for the full-time director of the South Carolina University Press position. But I don't have to tell you this, Dr. Lynn. I believe the South Carolina Press represents the cultural heartbeat of the state. I have a long and fruitful association with it. And Jonathan Haupt recently got me to write an introduction to State of the Heart, a group of personal essays by South Carolina writers edited by Aida Rogers. The amazing thing about this fact is that Jonathan Haupt never passed a single nickel or dime from his hand to mine. He gets me to do things by his professionalism, his complete charm, and the love of the work he does. He understands his role as a caretaker of the South Carolina experience, and he causes me to think about it as he entices me in his cobra-like fashion when he explains what new favor I can do for him. If he gets this job, I would like you to demand he never ask a single thing of me again. But I admire his passion and dedication for his job and his enormous dedication to getting it done right. I was once a student in a class um, excuse me, I was once a student of the great James Dickey on your campus. It was in that class that I learned of the central importance of the South Carolina press. I think Jonathan Haupt is the best thing that ever happened to the press. I urge you and your committee to support him and get him off my back. Very sincerely yours, Pat Conroy. And that's what a Pat Conroy friendship was like. He was on your side, but he was on your side with a tremendous sense of warmth and a sense of humor. And Pat and I, when I was director of USC Press, created a partnership together. We created a fiction imprint, sort of a company within a publishing company called Story River Books that I know some of you are familiar with. But for those of you who aren't, this was a Pat's chance, really during the last five years of his life, to become a teacher again in a really wonderful sense. Story River published 22 novels and short story collections, not by Pat Conroy, obviously, by other writers that Pat and I found and championed and ultimately published together. And several of those books have gone on to become national award winners. Many of those writers have gone on to publish other books as well. It's a really wonderful experience for Pat to help those writers who may not have been able to be published without somebody like Pat Conroy on their side. And it was a wonderful experience for Pat's readers to discover through Pat's enthusiasm that there are other writers out there that they could read and support and get behind. For me, it was transformative. It showed me a model of service to my literary community and my friends that I don't think I was living up to until that point. Pat became a tremendous mentor to me. When he was a young person here in Beaufort, uh, when he came in, in 1961 as a 16 year old kid, he fell under uh, the gaze and the mentorship of an English teacher named Jean Norris. And Pat always said that Gene spotted him, meaning Gene saw Pat's untapped potential. He saw something in Pat that Pat didn't even recognize in himself. Nobody spotted me when I was 16, but Pat Conroy spotted me as an adult. And his faith in me, his belief in me, just transformed my life. So one of the things I got to do for Pat uh, as, a, as a tremendous honor, and it leads into why there is a, a, an Our Prince of Scribes book, is as Pat's 70th birthday was coming around October of 2015, 
I created a festival here in Buford, a three-day festival called the Pat Conroy at 70 Festival. And Pat uh, was a little reluctant to participate in it in, in initially, honored that we were having it, a little reluctant to participate. But in the end, he came to absolutely everything. Even when he wasn't supposed to be on stage, he would still be in the audience uh, supporting other writers who were there. And in that moment, in, in October of 2015, he seemed as healthy and as happy as, as he had been in all the years that I had known him. He began to get sick in January. He was, was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer and gone on March 4th of 2016. Leading up to that, uh, Pat and I were still selecting books for Story River for this fiction imprint that we had. And one of those books was by a writer named Nicole Seitz, uh, an exceptionally talented novelist and visual artist who lives and works and teaches in Charleston. And Nicole's book, um, the Cage Maker was working its way toward approval to be published. But this was about the time of our thousand year flood, which those of you in Columbia most certainly remember, and certainly those of you elsewhere in South Carolina do as well. And Nicole had taken it upon herself to very quickly put together a small anthology, just a few writers, some original material, some previously published material as a fundraiser for, uh, for flood relief. And we both ended up at the Decalage Literary Festival in Columbia. The first year there was a Decalage Festival, uh, which Richmond Library was a partner with during all, all the years that festival existed. And Nicole was there and she was supposed to be talking about this flood relief anthology. And I was there with a group of Story River writers and I was supposed to be talking about them. But that weekend was when Pat Conroy announced to the world that he had been diagnosed with pancreatic cancer and things that I had known and others uh, in, in Pat's circle had known, now everybody knew. So that's all anybody at Decalage wanted to talk about, naturally, understandably so. And as Nicole and I shared our own Pat Conroy stories with each other, we started to realize that every writer at that festival, almost without exception, had a Pat Conroy story too. Either they had known him and he had been influential to them in person, or they had simply read him on the page and wished that they could be a writer like Pat Conroy that his, his, the gravitational force of Pat Conroy was so big, it seemed to include every single writer we knew. So that weekend, we began talking about the possibility of doing what Nicole had done with the Flood Relief Anthology for Pat, gathering together a few stories, maybe a dozen, from writers who had been in Pat's orbit, um, and, and having them write these quickly and getting this book out quickly, maybe even quick enough that Pat himself would, would get to read them. Two weeks later to the day was the day that Pat Conroy passed away. And this anthology, this project that we had in mind took on a completely different weight at that point. It became something that was going to be part of Pat's legacy. And it became something that we knew would be therapeutic and healing, not just for folks who would get to read it, but for all the writers who would be invited to participate in it as well. So we stopped thinking about it being about 12 writers and it became how many writers do you think we can get and who are those writers and do we know them? And if we don't know them, who knows them that we know? And in the end, we spent a year and a half gathering stories about Pat Conroy from 67 different writers. Folks, if you make it to the end of your life and 67 people still like you, you've done pretty well. If they want to tell stories about you in a book, that's even better. And 67 writers are by no means every single writer whose life Pat touched. It's not even close. They are a representative set as well. Part of the work was sort of done for us by the, the natural momentum of writers wanting to mourn the passage of someone like Pat Conroy. For example, Rick Bragg, Pulitzer Prize winner, wrote a beautiful piece in memory of Pat Conroy, which was originally published in Southern Living in his column in the back of that magazine. Kathleen Parker, another Pulitzer Prize winner, wrote a beautiful piece about Pat Conroy that appeared in the Washington Post. Mark Childress, a fantastic writer from Alabama, didn't write something for public ped uh, publication, but he posted a really beautiful note <clears throat> on his Facebook feed that I saw that, that became the starting point uh, for his Our Prince of Scribes essay. So Nicole and I were reaching out to all of these writers to gather their stories, and every so often one of those writers would say, well, if you're open to this, I can recommend this other writer who I think you would be interested in. Kathleen Parker, for example, uh, recommended that her son, John Connor Cleveland, be considered for the book. 
I thought, oh, that's adorable. Now I have to go look at some piece by Kathleen Parker's son and find a nice way to, to say no to her. And then I read the piece and it was extraordinary and it made it into the book. And that was John Connor's uh, first publication. So there was this uh, sort of pathfinding momentum to this where we would go to writers that we knew and they would lead us to writers that we didn't know. And over time, that number grew to, to 67. Uh, you know, at some point when it, when it really started to take off, we thought maybe we can get to 70. Because Pat was 70 when he passed away. Wouldn't that be great? Numbers are, are so often meaningful in the writing of, of Pat, in the life of Pat, for that matter. Trying to land on a, a sort of Conroy number had a, had a particular appeal to it. And we didn't quite get to 70. 67, however, as we realized later, was the year that Pat graduated from the Citadel, Citadel class of 67. So without even trying to land on that particular Conroy number, there we were nonetheless. The uh, other amazing thing that happened, which we could not have done intentionally had we tried, was that the 67 writers who participated in the book all knew Pat at different times and in different ways, and many of us did not even know each other before this began. But as these pieces started to come in, sometimes two or three at a time, sometimes just one at a time, sometimes a week or two of nothing, a pattern started to emerge, a chronology started to emerge. And Nicole, being the talented novelist that she is, started to see the story take shape and figured out how to arrange all of these essays from different writers all over the country, to some degree all over the world, if we count Jonathan Carroll in Austria, and started to arrange them in a real narrative of Pat's life, not in the same way that he told his own story. He had 12 books in which he did that, memoir and autobiographical fiction, but this was the story of Pat Conroy as we experienced it alongside of him. So during this year and a half, a lot of things changed for Nicole and I. We both uh, changed jobs. As I mentioned, I had been director of USC Press, and the best thing about being in publishing for me at that point was working with Pat Conroy. There was no more Pat Conroy, so I was uh, actively looking for other opportunities, including many outside of South Carolina. I didn't really want to leave South Carolina, but while Nicole and I were busy putting together all of these essays for this book, this place, the Conroy Center, was being envisioned and created by Pat's family and his friends and his agents, and I was really honored to be invited to become the first director of the Conroy Center, a challenge which I, I readily accepted when it was offered to me. So when I left USC Press, all of the interest in Pat Conroy that that press had left with me. So now we have this beautiful book that's starting to take shape and no publisher, and that's a problem. Um, so I went back to my first publishing mentor, Lisa Baer, who hired me straight out of grad school at Southern Illinois University. And Lisa had become the, uh, the director of the University of Georgia Press on the very same day that I became director of the University of South Carolina Press. And Pat was born in Atlanta. Pat has all sorts of Georgia connections. So UGA Press was not only enthusiastic about publishing our Prince of Scribes, they went to the Georgia Writers Hall of Fame, uh, which is a partnership they have, and they asked for what's known in publishing as a subvention, which is a fancy word for money, to uh, publish the first print run. And the Georgia Writers Hall of Fame, which inducted Pat Conroy, which has never given to a, a book project publication before, underwrote the first print run of Our Prince of Scribes and has been thrilled to see how well that book has done. It's opened up possibilities for the Hall of Fame to support other publications in time as well. So the book originally came out in September of 2018, which is almost two years ago. Paperback edition came out a year later. Since then, uh, the book has gone on to win 14 awards, which I'm going to show you because I'm kind of embarrassingly proud of that. Let me put that slide up for you. Yeah, uh, the most recent of these was just about a week and a half ago, uh, National Indie Excellence Award, a, a book for small press publishers. So there they are. Some of these are major awards and some are relatively minor awards. Pat Conroy used to joke that he had never won an award anybody had ever heard of, and we've certainly won a few of those too. But uh, the book has been in tremendously well received. But awards are kind of sort of the least meaningful part of this. What's been the most meaningful for me is the enthusiasm that the writers and the readers have had for this project. Of the 67 writers who are in the book, 
54 of us have now participated in at least one event across a dozen states during the two years that this book has existed. And initially, all of those events were uh, sort of panel conversations where two, four, six of us, whatever it would be, would get together at a book festival or a library or a school, and we would tell amusing, educational, hopefully inspirational stories about our friend, Pat Conroy. And that would be our chance to get to know one another as well, because many of us, even though we all knew Pat Conroy, didn't actually know one another when this was beginning. But over time, the question and answer sessions uh, that would follow those panels sort of to take on this pattern, it became clear that a lot of the people who were attending were writers themselves or had ambitions of being writers and they had good writerly questions, not so much about Pat Conroy, sometimes not even about the panelists, but about the business of writing or the craft of writing. And most of the 67 writers in this book are teachers in one sense of the word or another, either that is their profession or they have the capacity when called upon to be a good teacher or a good mentor. So about a year ago, we held the first Our Prince of Scribes Writers Conference in Charleston, in partnership with our statewide writers organization, South Carolina uh, Writers Association. And that workshop sold out immediately and we raised the cap and it sold out again. And it became this wonderful thing where we could get four, maybe five of the contributors to Our Prince of Scribes together. We would all donate our time. We wouldn't make a dime off of the workshops any more than we make a dime off of the book. Um, and we would teach these classes and would keep the price as low as we possibly could. And we've had writers uh, at all levels of experience come and, and take part in these workshops. We're about to have a fourth one. Let me see if I can load the slide up for that one real quickly here. That's coming up at the end of August and it will be our first one to be held as a hybrid event, meaning um, you can attend from anywhere online on Zoom as we are right now, but we're doing this in partnership with the Morris Center for Low Country Heritage, which is in Richland, South Carolina, a few towns over from where we are. And they've got a big, beautiful event space there where uh, socially distant seating for up to 20 is possible. So we'll have an in-person audience as well. And uh, we've got uh, a unique teacher in that group. I'm not gonna mention now, cause I'll come back around to her in a second, uh, but certainly won't be the last one of these we do. We have ambitions for taking these out of South Carolina as well as in-person events when it's possible to resume those and certainly continuing them online as well. So it's our chance to really honor the spirit of the book. We all participated in the book because Pat was a mentor to us and, and the, the workshops, the conferences are our way to mentor other writers to help find the next Pat Conroy who is certainly out there, probably many more than, than just one of them. So uh, at this point, I wanna read a couple of stories from Our Prince of Scribes, and then I'm gonna turn it over to you as a sort of choose your own adventure, and you're gonna help me pick some other ones that, that I will get to tell as well. But there are three that I always like to share from the book uh, and give each one a little bit of context as well. Um, and the first one is, uh, is fairly early in the book. It's from a writer named Valerie Sayers. And if that name isn't familiar to you yet, I hope hearing a little bit about Valerie will send you out to find her books, which are phenomenal. She is from right here in Beaufort. Pat Conroy was her high school teacher. After Pat graduated from the Citadel in 1967, a lot of his more casual fans assumes he goes straight out to Defusky Island for the year that becomes the inspiration for The Water is Wide, but that's not what happens at all. There are two years in between where Pat is back at Buford High, same Buford High he went to as a, a junior and senior in high school himself. And he's teaching government and psychology in his first year. In his second year, uh, during a, a period <clears throat> uh, uh, of transformation at the school, Pat teaches what very, uh, very well may have been the first African-American studies class taught in any public school in the state of South Carolina. School was not yet integrated, but through a program called Freedom of Choice, there were about 100 African-American students on campus, and Pat really wanted to do something that supported them, so he created this class. But Valerie uh, was one of Pat's psychology students. And here I have to mention what Valerie's dad did for a living. He was a civilian psychologist at Paris Island at the Marine Corps Training Depot. So her father did for his livelihood the thing that Pat Conroy was just then learning how to teach. And she should have been Pat's toughest critic um, 
But I want to read to you how Valerie describes her teacher, Pat Conroy. This is the 1969 school year. And this is just the first paragraph from Valerie's essay, which is entitled Golden. We must have called him Mr. Conroy, but that's hard to imagine. Outside class, if we thought we were cool, we referred to him as Pat. When we gossiped, we called him Pat Conroy, one word on one breath, a movie star's name. When he paced our high school psychology classroom, he was all performer, good looking in a Paul Newman, cool hand Luke kind of way, only taller, younger, cooler. He was master of the sudden pause, the beat, the punchline. He told us funny, self-deprecating stories, his fears, his gaffes, and we didn't believe a word. Two years out of the Citadel, he was only six or seven years older than we were. But he was Robert Kennedy, Wilt Chamberlain, and the Beatles rolled into one. Sounds like an incredible teacher, right? Well, here's one example of how Pat taught this psychology class. There was a problem at Beaufort High that was not being addressed to anyone's satisfaction, including Pat's, and it had to do with teen pregnancy. The teen pregnancy rate at Beaufort High was really high at that time, and there was no sex education class. It's still the small town south in the late 1960s. Beaufort wasn't ready for that. So Pat introduced the sex education topic into his psychology class under the guise of human sexuality. And teen pregnancy rates at Beaufort High actually dropped because of that. Something about hearing sex described by Pat Conroy made teenagers want nothing whatsoever to do with it. It was a really successful technique. And Valerie was one of the students in that class. So she not only learned psychology from Pat, she also learned sex ed, but more than anything else, what she learned was storytelling. Pat Conroy was never Valerie's English teacher, but he taught everything in that class as a story. Valerie's gone on to publish six novels. Two of them were made into a film together, uh, Due South, uh, which was made, I think, on, on um, Cinemax during Sybil Shepherd and Robert Forrester. Really nice cast. She has a first collection of short stories that's just come out called The Age of Infidelity. And on a podcast that I have, I'll be interviewing Valerie in a couple of months. She's also one of the board members here at the Pat Conroy Center. So I've gotten to work with Valerie and teach with her. And she's a phenomenal person. One of the first uh, bits of fan mail I got for this book, if I can call it fan mail, was a letter from one of Valerie's classmates who is a burgeoning writer here in Buford who participates in our, our local writers group. And she sent me a note saying that when she saw that Nicole and I and all these other writers were doing this book, Our Prince of Scribes, she knew immediately that she wanted to buy a copy, but she wasn't sure she ever wanted to read it because in her words, she didn't want to be sad 67 times. Uh, but she read Valerie's essay and she cried and she laughed and she got to know a side of her teacher that she never knew before. And she told me she spent the next day reading everything, not in any particular order, going back and forth, discovering all these things about this guy that she had known since she was 15 or 16 years old. And she felt like she knew him on a completely different level after reading this book. And that's what it's been like for me too. In many ways, I feel like I'm still getting to know my friend. But the story that absolutely convinced her that this book was not gonna make her sad 67 times is the other one that I wanna to read to you right now. This is from a writer named Ron Rash, and I bet that is a name familiar to a lot of you out there. Ron's uh, a, a poet and a short story writer and a novelist, and a couple of his novels have been turned into films, the one you're probably familiar with, although it wasn't a particularly good movie. It's called Serena, and Ron has a new collection coming out, uh, I think next month, I think early in August, called The Valley which is a collection of stories and a novella that's set in the universe of Serena. So he's sort of returning to the world of that novel and gonna tell some more stories. Ron can be very serious. It's hard in some ways to imagine he has any particular sense of humor. And Pat sort of took that as a kind of challenge as he came to know Ron and champion Ron. Ron and Pat and Pat's wife, Cassandra King, were doing uh, this sort of weekend author talk slash writer's retreat in the Highlands in North Carolina on a fancy historical end. And everybody there was being really nice to Ron. I mean, nicer than, than people normally are to even a celebrity writer. And Ron couldn't quite figure out why that was all weekend. And as he was leaving, uh, the desk clerk sort of pulled him up close and said, Mr. Rash, we just want you to know everyone here is completely on your side. We're so proud of how well you're doing. Mr. Conroy told us before you arrived 
that you're a recovering meth addict and you've only been clean for two weeks uh, and we think you're doing really well. Ron's never been a meth addict. That was Pat just uh, having a bit of fun with Ron. So that was really the nature of their friendship. It was sort of a, an element of one-upmanship. And this is what Ron writes about in his essay, which I want to read to you here, just a section from it. So this is the middle part. Uh, and this is an example of that sort of competitive one-upmanship. There was no story you could ever tell Pat Conroy that he could not top. And I also want to read this one because it's one of the few uh, essays in the book that relates to libraries. So in honor of our host, Richland Library, I picked this one as well. So this is Ron and Pat comparing stories about book signings. So this is Ron speaking here. The subject of dispiriting book signings came up and I told Pat that I had just endured the worst such signing ever. Let's hear it, Pat said. I told him about an event years earlier when I had done a reading and a signing in a small library in South Carolina. Books would be available for sale, my host assured me. The books were indeed there, but the audience was not. Three people showed up, the person who invited me, a friend of his who promptly fell asleep, and a grim-faced nun who appeared to have come solely as an act of penance. After my event, I dutifully went pen in hand to the signing table. None of the three came near the table. Zero books sold, I told Pat. No one even picked one up to pretend they might buy it. They didn't even touch a book. It doesn't get worse than that. Pat looked at me, a twinkle in his eye. Oh, no, 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 Pat said in his way. I can top that. How do you top zero books sold, I said. I'll tell you how, Pat answered, and began a story about a book signing soon after his self-published The Boo came out. The signing was in a chain bookstore. He'd be given a, he had been given a chair and a small table on which he placed copies of the book. He sat and waited for customers to come his way. As the two-hour signing was about to expire, Pat hadn't sold a single book. Few people had even made eye contact. But then an elderly man did. He came over and spent the next few minutes talking to Pat, finally picking up a book to peruse it. After a while longer, he decided to purchase a copy but only if Pat would personalize the book for him. So Pat asked the man's name, wrote the name and a few words, then signed and dated the book. The man thanked Pat and was about to go pay for the book. Then, according to Pat, the man took one step toward the checkout counter, fell to the floor and died. That's not zero, Pat said, since the book could neither be sold nor returned. That's minus one. Pat told that story a lot. Did that ever happen? Probably not, but who cares? It's a good story. And that's a good example of the sense of humor of Pat and the way in which he would mentor the writers he befriended. Pat, Ron, Ron was feeling terrible about this book signing and Pat found a way to lift his spirits with a wonderful story. He would do things like that all the time. He would always find the right thing to say in exactly the right way. Many of these stories have that sort of hero's tale quality to them. Uh, there are quite a few that fall into a category I've come to think of as in walked Conrack, where there's a writer who's uh, down on his luck or her luck, or maybe hasn't had anything published yet and is worried nothing's ever going to be published, or worse yet, they've had a book published and nothing's happened. It's not at all the life they've imagined. But uh, there's that moment where they're on the cusp of, of giving up, and in walks Pat Conroy who very often is a writer they've never ever met before, but they know who he is. Everybody knows who Pat Conroy is, and he will be drawn to them. They don't even have to come up to him. He will know, he will sense it in so many of these essays. He will go over, he will introduce himself, and he will listen Just Pat, always a good teacher, always a good listener, and he'll find the right thing to say, or he'll find the right introduction to make, whether it's a book or a person or a connection. And it'll give that writer something that they didn't have. It will make them go on to whatever the next step is. Many of the stories that fall into that category, I had never heard because they weren't uh, unfolding in front of anyone else. There's no audience, there's no public. It's just a writer and Pat Conroy having a conversation. And those writers were incredibly generous to share those stories. So maybe you'll get to hear one if you pick one. Because what I've done, if you can see that, is uh, handpick about 12 of these and I've numbered them. So this is where our bibliomancy begins. You all out there in audience land are going to pick a number and post it in our chat feature here. And I'm going to go with whatever the first number is I see. 
Seven, we got a seven. Okay, let's see who number seven is. Oh, seven is Sandra Brown. Anybody out there know who Sandra Brown is? I see a number four. I'll do that one next. Uh, right now with seven here. So Sandra Brown, uh, New York Times bestselling author of like 72 novels, something ridiculously huge like that of, uh, let's say, thrillers uh, and mysteries. Fantastic writer, lives in Texas. She also has a home in North Carolina and on Hilton Head, actually, not far from where I am. Um, but she is also the mother of a writer. Her son, Ryan Brown, who is a soap opera actor, among other things, got very interested in writing a novel and just couldn't quite figure out how to do it. He decided he wanted to write a novel about a zombie football team, because who doesn't need a book about a zombie football team? But, uh, you know, the, 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 the concept was good and he had no particular weight to this. He just couldn't find his way through. So Sandra took it upon herself after she befriended Pat Conroy to find a moment to introduce Ryan to Pat. And Pat, who probably didn't know much about zombies, but quite a lot about football, listened attentively to this story from, uh, from Sandra's son, Ryan, about this novel he was trying to write. And he realized nothing, nothing's at risk. You know, it's, a, it's a good concept, but nothing's at risk. Why does the zombie football team have to win the big game? What happens if they do? What happens if they don't? And that short, simple conversation with Pat Conroy got Ryan to reimagine the whole book, which has been published to rave reviews. It's called Play Dead. And it was Ryan's first book, not his only one. He has a, a later one as well. But that's not the passage I want to read. That's a good story. That's not the passage I want to read. This is uh, Sandra describing uh, a meal she got to share with Pat Conroy. Pat, of course, had a cookbook, Pat Conroy cookbook, phenomenal cookbook, phenomenal collection of stories. But Sandra didn't think she was a particularly good cook. So um, the passage I'm gonna read to you relates to that. Uh, so this is Sandra speaking, of course. I was nervous around him only once, and that was when I cooked for him. Pat loved food, he published a cookbook, and I'm a card-carrying non-cook. When I told him that, he chided me, saying that if I could read, I could cook. That's a good line. That's also Pat quoting himself, by the way, that appears uh, you know, in the voice of Tom Wingo in Prince of Tides, but that's Pat stealing his own material. This was one of those friendly arguments which Pat won by virtue of his tenacity. So in a weak-minded moment, my husband and I invited Pat and Cassandra to dinner and the menu was up to me. I fell back on what I knew. The one thing I could kind of make even a little bit tasty was Texas chili. First, I had to get the all clear from Sandra. Did they have any dietary restrictions? Pat did, but she told me that he would love chili. He arrived at our house, went straight to the kitchen stove, raised the lid on the chili pot, sniffed, and asked what was in it. I quoted what I'd once heard a cowboy say about chuck wagon chili. If you can't tell what's in it, it ain't did right. Pat laughed, and as I recall, ate two servings. He might have had heartburn later, but he professed my chili to be delicious, the best he'd ever had. Possibly he was just a damn good liar, but I chose to believe he was exercising that incredible charm I had referenced earlier. For having known Pat Conroy, the author and the man, my life was truly blessed. And Sandra's been very generous to participate in events for our print subscribes as well, which you certainly don't need to do if you're the New York Times bestselling author of 72 books. But that's the kind of loyalty that Pat inspired in his friends. I saw number four next, so I'm going to uh, go to that one, and then I'll, I've not seen any number that posted after that. Um, oh, we've got a request for 12. Okay, 12's a good one, too. Do you know how when you go into a restaurant, no matter what you order, the server always says, oh, excellent choice. That's, uh, that's sort of my approach tonight as well. But we're at number four right now, and that's from a writer I've gotten to know really well lately. Her, her name is Kathy Murphy. And if she's familiar to you at all, it is because she is the creator, the founder of the largest book club in the United States called the Pulpwood Queens Book Club. And at any given time, there are about 2,000 members in uh, roughly, what is it now, 800 book clubs around the country, including one that meets right here in the Conroy Center, our Beaufort-based chapter. Um, but Kathy uh, was trying to get Pat Conroy to come to the uh, annual events of the Pulpwood Queens, which is called Girlfriend Weekend, and held in a tiny little town called Jefferson, Texas, a beautiful town, but a tiny remote town. And Pat would just no, never want to go. 
but he decided to go uh, eventually, finally sort of won over to this idea of going. And he went uh, with his daughter, Melissa, uh, second oldest of the four Conroy daughters, and we're fortunate to have Melissa's sister, Megan, with us uh, on the call tonight, all the way from California. Uh, but um, Melissa had her first children's book out, a book called Poppy's Pants, and she was there promoting that book. And Pat was there with his book, uh, My Reading Life, which is the Conroy book uh, that's closest to my heart, uh, my, my, the one that I love the most. And they arrive in Jefferson, Texas, and discover that Kathy has decided that year that there's going to be a fundraiser for the Dolly Parton Imagination Library. Really wonderful uh, nonprofit, uh, does amazing work. And all of the authors that year were expected to bring an item to be auctioned at this fundraiser. And Pat has brought nothing. He has come unprepared in true Conroy style. So in honor of his daughter's book, in honor of Poppy's Pants, Pat decides to donate a pair of his own pants, the khakis uh, Pat was always wearing, which he signed. Uh, they sold to a writer at auction, a writer named M.L. Malcolm from New York for $1,000. And uh, M.L. Malcolm turned around and gave them to Kathy, the woman who was running the event. And Kathy had them put in a shadow box, which she told me cost her $800. So now $1,800 have been spent on a pair of Pat Conroy's pants. Uh, and that shadow box stayed in Kathy's home in Texas until last year, until she and her best friend, Tijuana, drove them across country here to donate them to the Pat Conroy Literary Center, where they're now on display. And if you go to the Faulkner Museum, uh, if you go to any other writer house, I guarantee you're not going to see a signed pair of that writer's pants on display. That's very much a Pat Conroy exclusive. But that uh, that fundraiser still continues and the Pulpwood Queens just celebrated their 20th anniversary um, this year, this January. And for the past, what is it, three years or four, either three or four years, that fundraiser has been for us, for the nonprofit Pat Conroy Literary Center. And what it's what helps us hold author programs for free um, here in Buford and other places that we're able to do that. Uh, so that is, to some extent, what Kathy writes about. But just to give you a little quick sense of her voice, I want to read something, just a passage here. There we are. There we are. Okay, so this is Kathy kind of lamenting that she's not been able to spend much time with Pat in person at this festival after finally getting him to come. I had a book festival to run. Later, I had saved a seat so I could at least I could at least sit uh, a few minutes with Pat at the festival, but alas, another Pulpwood Queen had nabbed the spot and was not budging. I was on the brink of tears. Would I ever get to talk to my hero, Pat Conroy? Not much. Time was not on my side that year. A month after the event, I received a phone call from Pat. I was beside myself. He told me, Kathy thought the book publishing world was over. I thought no one really reads anymore. Then I came to your event, and I was wrong. I'd never seen anything like Girlfriend Weekend. Do you realize what you have created? You've given me back my faith in readers. Small, beautiful moment, but it was transformative for Kathy when she needed to hear that. She needed to know that somebody like Pat Conroy believed in what she was doing. So uh, and Kathy's become a great friend to us here at the Conroy Center too. So there was a call out for number 12, and then I saw number nine. And Kind of checking my watch here too to see how we're doing. 12 is excellent. Good call, whoever picked 12. This is Stephanie Austin Edwards, uh, which is a name that's not probably not that familiar to many of you. And I will say this just a, a sort of quick aside. Uh, when readers who have spent some time with this book come up to me afterwards and say, you know, I recognize about half of the names and uh, I didn't recognize the other half, but now I want to read them too. Pat Conroy would be so happy to hear anybody say that. Pat believed wholeheartedly that the spotlight was meant to be shared, that it was never just for one writer, and it certainly was never just for him. He was very good about introducing writers to his readers, and to think that we're still doing that through a book like Our Prince of Scribes, it's really meaningful to me. So, you know, I mentioned that because I'm sure not many folks know Stephanie Austin Edwards, 
but I hope you go look up her novel, uh, which is fantastic. Stephanie was a classmate of Pat's at Buford High School. So she, like Pat, was a student of Jean Norris's. And uh, she was two years, uh, two years behind Pat, but she was in many ways a sort of original witness to Pat Conroy becoming a writer because Pat was published for the very first time at Buford High when he was a junior uh, because the high school had a literary magazine called Breakers. And at that time, Pat wanted to be a poet more than anything else in the world. And he was writing poetry and that was what was being published in Breakers. Uh, and some of the pieces are remarkable. They show the promise of the writer Pat Conroy will become. And some of them are just terrible, angsty teenage boy poetry, um, the kind that a lot of us start out writing when we're 16 or 17 years old. But it meant so much to Pat to be published in Breakers that his, uh, his senior year, when he was 17, 18 years old, he joined the editorial staff. So at that point in his life, as a high school senior, Pat Conroy had already decided he was going to be a writer who helped other writers, which is the whole arc of the rest of his life. Um, it all begins at Buford High, uh, and Stephanie was there for that as well. So Stephanie has become uh, one of my great friends here in Buford. One of, the, one of the best experiences of being here in Buford has been getting to know Stephanie and her husband, Paul. She's one of our volunteers uh, at the center, and she teaches with us uh, more often than she's here in person. She was part of the original Our Prince of Scribes Writers Conference last year, and she'll be part of the fourth one that's coming up as well. And she also directs our local writers group that, as I mentioned, uh, generally meets here in the center, although we've been doing it online lately. So uh, this is, I wanna do two things uh, for Stephanie. One is read a passage from her book, which is not about knowing Pat in high school. It's actually about working with the Conroy Center here. And then I wanna tell you about the gift that Stephanie has, uh, has given me, uh, which will take us to another interesting story as well. So this is the last paragraph from Stephanie's essay written in the mindset of a, a Conroy Center volunteer. As a writer who has also returned to make my home in Pat's beloved Buford, I have seen firsthand what the literary center established in Pat's honor has come to mean to so many people so quickly. More than 2,500 people from 38 states and eight countries made a pilgrimage to the center during our first year. After listening to our tour, many guests have offered their own stories of meeting Pat and how he influenced their lives as readers, as writers, or simply as good citizens of the realm. Each story is distinctive, personal, and poignant. Sometimes it feels as though Pat is there with us, soaking up the love and guiding the experience for all of us here in Beaufort, Pat's home, his muse, and the town that first gave him what he needed most to become the best all around. Um, and I should mention that in high school, Pat's senior year, he was class president, captain and MVP of the basketball team, Mr. Congeniality, and best all around, which is the title of Stephanie's essay. So Stephanie, uh, who I've mentioned has become a great friend, comes into my office one day, and I'm gonna load a couple of slides for this, and she says, hey, wouldn't it be great if we had a high school intern? And this is when the Conroy Center is relatively new, and we're still trying to figure out what we are all gonna be about. There's Stephanie, and this is the intern she had in mind, Holland Perryman. And I'm going to confess freely that I was not on board for this idea when it was presented to me, only because the Conroy Center had so many different things to do that I really couldn't imagine inviting a kid into it who was going to be in our best interest. But Stephanie kept telling me this kid's a really remarkable writer, and she's a student leader, and uh, you just need to meet her, and don't worry too much about doing, having to do anything with her. I'll be her mentor, and you'll barely even see her. So Stephanie brings in Holland, who at 14 years old has a resume. Who at 14 has a resume? No one, no one but Holland Perryman. And uh, she's already on the cusp of becoming an award-winning writer through a contest that we helped create at Beaufort High. She won that uh, just before I met her, just before she became our intern. So rather reluctantly, I agree to have this kid join us as our first high school intern with the understanding that Stephanie is going to be her mentor. Well, Stephanie then has a lot of things happen in her life that simply don't make that possible anymore. And I become Holland's mentor. And I could not be happier that we have this kid in our lives here at the Conroy Center. She is basically the Pat Conroy of Buford High School right now, the best writer, best athlete, best student leader, and remarkably humble about the whole thing. So 
Holland has become a big part of what we do here at the Conroy Center. And there are some photos of us at assorted events, including at our very first Our Prince of Scribes Writers Conference. And here at the Conroy Center at a program that we did with a great guy from, uh, from Charleston, Sean Scapoletto, who's also part of our teaching program and an Our Prince of Scribes contributor. And then the last photo is us out at March 4th, which is an event that we created in honor of the day that Pat Conroy passed away. Uh, so rather than make it a day of mourning, it's become a day of education about social justice. And we go out to Penn Center, which is very near where Pat is buried, and uh, spend the day out there. And this year, Holland was part of organizing that event. Uh, we've also made March 4th part of, what, uh, part of our partnership with Buford High School as well. And Holland is a key component in making all of that happen. So rather than just have her participate as an intern, as an assistant with the Our Prince of Scribes Writers Workshop, Holland's actually gonna teach her, her very first class for an adult audience and at the end of August. She'll be team teaching with Sean. Uh, so that's her in the bottom there, right next to Sean. And she'll be doing this two days before her 16th birthday. She is basically the same age that Pat Conroy was when he came to Beaufort, South Carolina, 1961. So we are tremendously proud of Holland and all that she's achieved as an intern and certainly beyond that as well. And she's become sort of a secondary scribe in her way. And that all began, began because of Stephanie, because Stephanie was there when Pat Conroy was just starting out and she wanted to give a young writer right now at Buford High that same kind of chance. So uh, you know, that's what Holland has become for us. So that was number 12. I saw number nine pop up after that, I'm gonna, ask for a couple of more suggestions because we're doing okay on time. Uh, I can probably take uh, two more numbers after number nine here. Let's see what nine is. Uh, Tony Grooms, Anthony Grooms, fantastic writer from Georgia. And um, I'll be interviewing Tony actually next week on the podcast that the Conroy Center has. Tony uh, sort of had a reverse Pat Conroy experience uh, as compared to Pat's uh, going out to, oh, I see an asking for number 13. We'll end on number 13. That's a good one to end on. We'll do that one next. And then I'll, I'll open it up to, uh, to audience Q&A for other questions that might be out there. So this one and number 13 and then Q&A, all right? That's our plan moving forward. So uh, Tony's an African-American writer, uh, was, uh, was born in Virginia, but moved to, <clears throat> Uh, Georgia now where he teaches and writes. He's a two-time winner of the Lillian Smith Book Award, which is an award uh, given for uh, works of social justice. And Tony's most recent novel, The Vain Conversation, is one that Pat Conroy and I published. I mentioned that there were 22 books published in Story River. Uh, Tony's book is number 22. It was the last one. It was selected for publication along with Nicole Seitz's book, The Cage Maker, two days before Pat Conroy passed away and the last conversation I ever had uh, with Pat uh, on March 3rd, the day before he passed away. It may have been a one-sided conversation, but it was important to me, was that I got to tell him that, uh, that Story River would continue after, after he was gone, that Nicole's book and Tony's book would both be published. And Tony's become a great friend, and he'll be teaching a workshop for us here at the Conroy Center too. But uh, I mentioned the sort of reverse uh, waters wide experience he had. Waters Wide was Pat Conroy going out to Defusky Island to be the first white school teacher in an African-American community. Tony, through a pre program called Freedom of Choice, had the reverse experience. His parents sent Tony as a student to an all-white school when they had the opportunity to do that just before integration. So Tony read The Water is Wide, not as a student in school, later on as, as a young person, uh, and sort of recognized the reverse experience of his own of his own education there. And I want to read just a, a small piece from Tony's essay, and then we'll go to uh, essay number 13 here. So this is uh, Tony Grooms writing about his take on the Waters Wide, and therefore his take on Pat Conroy. Waters Wide is not fo solely focused on the school children, however. Conroy thinks deeply in what I think is at his core a gregarious personality he melds with all people. He seeks conversations, some uncomfortable, some rebuffed. He revels in the stories of the natural raconteurs he encounters. As a writer, he captured these stories and the voices that told them. He's also blessed with a nearly supernatural insight, able to see the strengths, vulnerabilities, 
sincerities and hypocrisies, and most importantly, able to touch on the ironies of the human experience. The black school teacher who loathes blacks, the white racist who is an essential resource for the black community, the white who speaks <clears throat> so terribly about blacks as a whole, but respects us as individuals. And Pat does not spare himself in this gaze, critiquing his own shortcomings and successes. The South that Pat Conroy writes about is a South I know, with tides and marshes and currents as complex as any coastal river. This is the complexity I hope to achieve in my own, re in my own writing. It was not until a few months before he died that I finally met Pat Conroy in person. I was meeting a writer who shared Pat Conroy's agent, and so I had an entree to the table where Pat and a group were dining in a restaurant, and I was in that group. This is at the, the, the Decatur Book Festival. I introduced myself to Conroy, and he warmly greeted me. I went around the table introducing myself to others and fell into conversation with someone I knew from years before. As we talked, I felt an arm slip into the crook of my elbow and Pat's smiling cherubic face come close to mine as he pressed into me, teasingly, pulling me warmly, charmingly into the sway of his current. Great teachers have a way like that. Really beautiful essay. So glad Tony participated in the project and he's been uh, a key part of what we've been able to do here at the Conroy Center as well. So we're gonna end uh, before questions with number 13, which is the essay by my co-editor, Nicole Seitz. Uh, a very nice one to end the reading portion with. So uh, just as a little quick context for this, uh, as I mentioned, uh, when I was talking about Tony, I, I was at Pat Conroy's bedside on March 3rd, the day before he passed away. Cassandra, Pat's wife, Pat's widow, invited me and my wife down, uh, knowing that the end would be, be coming, and we didn't even know if Pat would still be alive when we got there, uh, but he was, and a small circle of family and friends were there, and it's a really beautiful moment. It uh, remains the great honor of my life to have been invited to, to be part of that, to be able to uh, say what I needed to say to Pat, to Cassandra that day, be able to say goodbye and so much else. But while we're having this very sincere moment, at Pat's, uh, at Pat's bedside, outside a completely different scene is unfolding at the house. Because having so many people in this home has had uh, some repercussions on the septic system and it's backed up. So a plumber is called and that then turns into a team of plumbers. And while those of us who are near and dear to Pat and to one another are weeping at his bedside, outside the two windows along that wall, along that room, we're watching uh, plumber after plumber, workman after workman, uh, sometimes out there taking a smoke break, going into the backyard, trying to solve the septic tank problem, which in the end needs equipment. A trench has to be dug out there. And even though the house is fairly isolated, it does have neighbors on either side. And I'm sure there's some moment when they were over there at the other house thinking, they're not gonna bury him in the backyard, are they? It's just a, a comic, ridiculous moment, like something out of a Pat Conroy novel that was unfolding uh, while the man is, uh, is passing away in his home. And he died, uh, as I mentioned, March 4th um, at sunset. And as, as some folks who were there that evening have told me, the last rays of sunlight were actually coming through the window, landing on Pat when it happened, uh, you know, which I absolutely believe. It's a Conroy story, but it's a good one. So why not believe it? But I tell you all that so I can quickly tell you this. Uh, reporters were contacting me at that same time uh, because that's what reporters need to do when a famous person is about to pass away. You need to get your stories together. You need to invite people who know that writer to make comments. And I just absolutely did not want to write about Pat Conroy in the past tense. I was not prepared to do that. I certainly had things I wanted to say, but I was not prepared to do it in that moment. If anything, I wanted to write about him in the present tense. So when I got home on the evening of March 3rd, I took the opportunity to do something that I hadn't done the day before and really should have. And that was write to Nicole and tell her that her novel, uh, The Cage Maker, had been accepted for publication in Story River Books and that I'd gotten to tell Pat that. And I also wanted to ask her if she was still serious about doing a book, about doing a collection of essays for Pat. And I wrote that email about Pat in the first person um, and sent that to Nicole. <clears throat> and I'm gonna pick up 
uh, in her essay where she describes being on the receiving end of that email. I'll just read a piece of this and then we'll turn it over to your questions. <clears throat> I got an email from Jonathan saying Story River Books would like to publish my novel. It was the news I'd been waiting for for almost a year. Separately, he asked if I would agree to co-edit with him an anthology of writers' reflections on Pat Conroy. I read the note and then went downstairs to let it soak in. I'd write him in the morning, I thought, and then something came over me. No, I'd write him tonight, now. I accepted the offer with Story River three hours before Pat Conroy passed away. I awoke the next morning to learn the news of Pat's death from the Post and Courier. I felt a blow deeply, the yin and the yang of gain and loss. Still, I have inadequate words for that moment, but I do know this, even in death, Pat is still graciously giving. I will spend the rest of my writer days trying to honor this man. It is with sincere regret that I didn't realize sooner that he was just a man and nothing as large as the pedestal I'd put him on. If he had figured this out sooner, I might've allowed myself into his orbit, but some people shine so brightly in this earthly life that it can be blinding. Pat Conroy was no God, he was simply a man, a flawed, authentic, brilliantly talented man, bestowed with gifts of the pen and the heart, both of which he used well. And in the end, it doesn't matter if he knew my name, because I know his, and it's one I hope to carry on. And that's the spirit that informs the book, a book which would not exist without the generosity of 67 writers, and certainly without the generosity of Nicole Seitz, who gave so much of her time and talent to the book. But she did something else, which I want to show you just quickly before we transition to your questions here. Um, about uh, 70 days before the hardcover edition of Our Prince of Scribes came out, Nicole drew and hosted a sketch of Pat Conroy on her Facebook page. There it is. I think you can see that. And people responded really well to that, and understandably so. It's just a, a wonderful portrait of Pat. The next day she drew this sketch of Barbara Streisand and posted that, and I should mention, uh, if I haven't yet, that Ms. Streisand wrote a really beautiful foreword to Our Prince of Scribes. And once again, people responded really well to the portrait. And at that point, Nicole did the math, 67 writers in about as many days until the book would come out. She realized she could sketch every single one of us in the book, and all she had to do was one sketch a day a seemingly impossible task, particularly given that Nicole had a real job and a real family and hadn't even met many of us, hadn't, hadn't seen us in person. But she actually did that. She completed all 67 sketches before the book came out. And in my role as museum curator, I was able to turn that into an exhibit, which was originally here at the Conroy Center. And it's since toured to several other places and it will be with us um, in Richland at the uh, Morris Center for Low Country Heritage as a temporary exhibit there. And then we'll go back to Hilton Head, be part of an art league of Hilton Head display there. So this too has taken on a life of its own uh, due entirely to the generosity of Nicole, who you can see with me there, in, uh, the former Buxton Books location. So I am so grateful to Nicole for all of her many gifts in this project and so grateful to all of you for spending some time on Zoom with me to hear some Pat Conroy stories this evening. With that said, um, if I can get to the chat, if there are any questions there, or if our hosts want to point them out to me, I'd be very happy to answer uh, them if I can. Let's see if I can get the chat up here. Here you go. Uh, so I see one question here from Catherine. I wonder what Pat would say about the current political climate in this country and state. What words of wisdom would he offer about the Black Lives Matter movement? You know, I had a dream the other night where Pat was wearing a Black Lives Matter t-shirt. Uh, and You know, he has his way of making himself known. I think the guy who taught the very first African-American studies class in the state of South Carolina in the public school, as far as we know, and the guy who went out to Defusky Island would have very strong opinions and would be uh, doing a lot of interviews and a lot of Pat's famous letters to the editor in support of, of uh, all manners of equality, but certainly Black Lives Matter. That would be a subject very near and dear to Pat and, and was. Uh, I was out on Defusky Island uh, two days ago with Holland, actually, with my intern, her very first time to go. And one of Pat's students, Sally Ann Robinson, is out there now, a sixth generation native. She was one of the 18 students 
that Pat taught during that year at Defosky 1969, 1970 school year. Of those 18 kids that Pat taught, four of them went on to become teachers inspired by Pat Conroy. One of them being Sally Ann, who was a, a teaching assistant for a while and now is a tour guide, celebrity chef, actually featured in Oprah Magazine this month. Let me see if I've got that on my iPad here. And if so, I'll show you that real quickly. Um, yep, there we are. So that's Sally Ann in O Magazine. Uh, nice two page spread there in front of the house she lives in on Defusky. And that's Sally Ann's tour bus uh, for her own tour company, which she just started uh, about a year ago. So Pat was, was a champion to those kids, was a champion to so many people. And I think we'd be hearing from that champion right now if you were around to do that. So thank you for asking that question. Um, Got to get back into chat here. There we are. Uh, let's see. Could you tell us about Pat Conroy's writing process? Well, that would be a good question to answer since I'm sitting in front of his desk right now. And there we are. Yep. Uh, and here's, there's a, a question about whether or not Pat's daughter is still teaching in California. Um, yeah, she may want to answer that herself since she's on the call with us right now. But let me answer the question about Pat's writing, writing process uh, at this desk behind me. I should mention this is one of many desks that Pat had, uh, but this was the desk that he had on Fripp Island. It's probably something that he bought when he was in Rome. He may have he probably had it there as well. But some part of every book from Beach Music Forward was written longhand at yellow legal pads at this desk uh, behind me here. And we have it set up with that in mind. I'm not going to go behind it because my camera is mounted, but if we did go behind it, you would see a yellow eagle pad there with notes from some of Pat's grandkids uh, whom they visited not this summer, but last summer and left some really adorable notes on the yellow eagle pad for us. But Pat uh, would write, handwrite about five uh, or six pages a day. There's Megan answering the question. Thank you, Megan. I appreciate that. Uh, always handwritten, almost always on yellow legal pads. He never learned to type, and that had to do with Pat's father, the Colonel, Don Conroy, who wanted Pat to grow up to be a fighter pilot, just like dear old dad, and actually forbid Pat from taking typing in high school. Uh, Don thought Pat would always have secretaries or corporals to do his typing. So Pat just never learned, or so he said. Here's the wonderful way that Mr. Conroy kind of makes himself heard every so often. Most of the things that we have here in the center are from Pat's personal collection or are pieces that were created for the Conroy Center. But Pat was the executor of the estate of Jean Norris, uh, that high school teacher I had mentioned earlier, who Pat writes about quite a bit. And I've got a bunch of Jean's yearbooks and one day I was going through them and hadn't before because they weren't from years that related to Pat Conroy. So they just got pushed to the back and a letter fell out, a typed letter uh, from Pat Conroy which has a handwritten note on it that says basically, Gene, please keep this. It's the only letter I've ever typed. And Gene kept it in an old yearbook and there it was to be found. So, you know, we know Pat typed at least one letter because it's here, but late in life he learned uh, rather, rather reluctantly to type uh, because his grandkids had convinced him that email would be a good way to stay in touch with them. And I have a lot of Pat's emails. He never really found his way to capitalization or punctuation or the backspace or delete. So there are all these sort of rough hewn prose pieces, but there's really wonderful poetry to them. And that takes me back to the other thing I wanna say about Pat's writing process. He would write three to five pages a day, but he would read 200 pages a day. That was a goal that he was setting for himself since he was a sophomore in high school. Pat was always first and foremost a reader. And before he would write a word of prose on his yellow legal pad, he would spend at least an hour reading poetry to prime the pump, to get into that lyrical mindset that we love so much about Pat's writing, to get into the descriptive language uh, that we all recognize in Pat's writing, and to collect words. Pat was a journal keeper. He, would, uh, he was keeping handwritten journals from the age of about 15 or 16. Many of those are right there in Columbia. At the, um, at the Rare Books and Special Collections Library at USC. But what you'll often see in Pat's journals are the journal entries themselves, the, the notes, the beginnings of scenes, character descriptions, whatever it might be on the, on the right-hand side of the page. And on the left-hand side of the page are lists of words, uh, most likely words that Pat has found in the course of his daily poetry reading. 
words that he's going to try and incorporate into his prose writing, or he's going to go look up if he doesn't know what they mean. He was always a good dictionary user as well. But he was a collector of words and of stories, and you can see all that in Pat's writing process as well. Many writers, including folks like Ron Rash, have to exercise those muscles every day. They've just got to clock in and put a couple hours in the chair writing something, even if they end up throwing it all away, or they feel like they're not a writer and they feel like the skills are going soft. Late in life, Pat didn't need to do that. He could take days, weeks, occasionally months away from, from writing a novel or anything book length and then go back to it when the muse was there, when the inspiration was there and it would be waiting for him. And that's a pretty remarkable thing for a writer too. So that's a long winded answer to your question about Pat's writing process. Uh, but we got Megan's answer about teaching along the way too. So time well spent. Uh, are there any other questions out there that we've not answered or anybody else got a question you wanna close with? Just opening up our chat again. Can you, uh, where can we buy a copy of Our Prince of Scribes? Well, thank you for as asking that entirely unscripted question. I'm so grateful, whoever that was. Um, yeah, so since this is published by the University of Georgia Press, you can actually buy it anywhere and you can check it out from Richland Library if that's your uh, preferred method of getting it as well. But we do sell copies, autographed copies, of course, uh, right here in the Conroy Center. So you're welcome to contact us through our website about how to do that as well. And you know, I mentioned this quickly earlier, I wanna say it again so I can be very clear about this. None of the 67 writers in the book earn a dime of royalties from it. All of the royalties go to support the educational programs here at the, non, at the nonprofit Pat Conroy Center. Uh, Nicole and I always wanted that up front. Uh, some of the royalties from the very first printing supported Story River Books when there was a Story River Books that imprint no longer exists. So this center is our, is our opportunity to continue as Pat did and be a friend and an advocate to all of his fellow writers. And that's what we wanted the money from our Prince of Scribes to do as well. Sorry, I think I saw one more question come up there. I don't wanna leave anything unanswered if I can. Can you talk more about the March 4th event at Penn Center? Was it a one-time event or ongoing? Okay, that's a very good question. Grateful for that one as well. Yeah, we created March 4th in uh, the year after Pat Conroy passed away and it sort of occurred to us at the last minute that we should do something to commemorate this day that would not be a day of mourning, uh, would be I mean, not a day of celebration, but a day of, of education. And Pat Conroy is buried uh, on Penn Center property on St. Helena Island, two sea islands out from where we are here in Buford, very intentionally. He, he is uh, a Roman Catholic white guy buried in a historic African-American Baptist cemetery. That takes a lot of special permission. But we come to understand this as Pat's last act as a teacher, because from visiting the graves of writers who were dear to him, he knew that his readers, he knew that folks like us would want to visit his grave, that we want to go out there and have a moment with him. And, and he's right, the gravesite has become a literary pilgrimage site. Folks leave behind all, all sorts of interesting things out there. Uh, which is really wonderful to see in its way. But we wanted to create March 4th in the spirit of Pat's last act as a teacher and go out to Penn Center and give people a chance to learn about the history of this place, uh, which was really wonderful school for the newly freed enslaved people of the Sea Islands during the American Civil War and, and immediately afterwards. It was kind of quiet for a while, but during the 1950s and 1960s, it was one of the few places in the country where blacks and whites could safely meet together. And because of that, it became a hub, a haven, I should say, of activity during the civil rights movement. And Gene Norris, Pat's teacher, who I've mentioned a couple of times, took young teenage Pat Conroy out there to Penn Center to be part of that, to, to not just be a witness to it, but to be part of it. And Pat met Dr. Martin Luther King and Jesse Jackson and Julian Bond and all of these wonderful leaders of the civil rights movement. And that's what was influencing Pat's decision to be buried out there. He wanted people who were gonna go see his grave to learn something on the way. And you can't get to Pat's grave without going through Penn Center and learning at least a little something about that history. So March 4th was created with that in mind. Let's do something educational at Penn Center to honor Pat. That first year, we had about 60 people participate, almost all of them from right here in Beaufort County. 
at a, at a, uh, we did a nature walk that day with Drew Lanham, who's a really wonderful naturalist and poet and memoirist uh, from Clemson University. He's become a good friend to us here. Uh, and we did some discussions and some panels, nothing, nothing terribly elaborate, but had a really nice experience, enough to convince us we should do it again. So the second year we went from having 20, uh, excuse me, having 60 people to having 120, which was the capacity of the building we were in, sold out. And they came from 11 states that year uh, and it grew. Uh, the third year we did it, it sold out again, 120 people. And that year we had our first partnership with Beaufort High School. There was a, a writer, was and is a writer, I should say, named Nick Stone from Atlanta, who had written a novel called Dear Martin, a uh, social justice themed young adult novel. It's being turned into a series for Netflix and she's written a sequel to it and, and a bunch of other wonderful things have happened to her in the meantime. But uh, through a grant, we were able to buy 1,300 copies of that book and have an all read at Beaufort High School that year. So we went from 120 people uh, the year before for March 4th to now you know, nearly 1,500 people between the two days of events. And one of the things that the high school did as part of having Nick Stone there was have a writing contest uh, around the themes of the book, around the themes of Dear Martin. And Holland Perryman uh, won that contest before she became our intern. That was one of the ways in which I, I uh, started to realize just what uh, an incredible talent Holland is. So uh, we were able to do the Buford High School partnership again this year uh, as well. And we will have a March 4th, whether it's in person or virtual or both of those things next year, we'll soon discover. But this has become a signature annual event for us at the center. And uh, we're really proud of what it's become very quickly because it, it wasn't us doing that. It's, it's not a, a ton of Conroy Center money that's going into that. It's the momentum of, of uh, folks who, are, who honor Pat, uh, to whom Penn Center is dear, coming out and participating and making that possible. So yeah, we've not announced next year yet, but we'll be doing that uh, sometime this fall. And it's definitely an annual event. And by all means, do come and participate. It's a really wonderful day out there, Penn. I may have seen one more question pop up. How do you get out to Penn Center? Yes, that's a good question. So from here in Beaufort, you would take the Woods Memorial Bridge and you follow the signs. Penn Center is a historic district, so there are a lot of those really wonderful brown park signs. You'd go out to um, St. Helena to the red light and uh, let's see from there, it would be a right-hand turn and you're gonna go straight through the heart of Penn Center. Everything, uh, uh, surrounding you out there is on Penn Center property, including a really beautiful branch of uh, the Beaufort County Library, the St. Helena Branch Library, Architecture Award-winning library, just to take it back around to libraries in honor of our host, Richland Library. And Pat Conroy is more or less buried behind the library. Uh, that's what the graveyard backs up to out there. And I think uh, for that guy who was trying to read 200 pages a day, and had 8,000 books in his personal library. That was probably part of his thinking for wanting to be out there as well. All right, gang, I think that was our last question. Is that right? Yes. Yeah, I think so. Um, well, thank you so much, Jonathan, um, for being able to uh, video chat with us tonight. And um, Pat was such an incredible writer and such an incredible person. And I always love hearing new stories about him. And it seems like, you know, the last time that you came out to, to Richland, I heard some incredible stories I hadn't heard before and then tonight as well. So I hope that everyone uh, will get a chance, if they haven't already read our Prince of Scribes, that they will get a chance to. Um, and also you can follow Richland Library on Facebook and hear about some other incredible events that we have going on. But thank you, Jonathan, so much for being with us. Uh, thank you, Kristen. Thanks, everybody out there. I, I really enjoyed it. So y'all take care. Come All see right. us at the Conroy Center if you get a chance. Absolutely. And please, everyone, stay safe. Yes, absolutely. <laughs>